I was a year out of college and had just moved back to the North Shore area about four weeks before the storm hit. When the call came to evacuate, I packed up with my family and four other families that we were very close with to caravan out of the area. We evacuated, but finding a place to stay was troublesome. We wound up going all the way to Northeast Texas where we stayed in a campground for two nights before going to a friend of a friend of a cousin's lake house near Oklahoma. We stayed for about four more days before we heard rumors that you could get back down south. Mind you that there was no cellular service much past Baton Rouge for a while. There was significant storm damage and power outages as far north as Natchitoches, Louisiana. So we drove to Jackson, Mississippi and, of all things, stayed at a lovely B&B for two nights while we tried to get supplies. Mind you, Jackson is almost 200 miles north of New Orleans and every store was either very low or completely out of gasoline, candles, batteries, bottled waters, generators, you name it. We wound up finding a small mom and pop hardware store that sold oil lamps and lamp oil, so we bought all of those, about three dozen lamps and all the lamp oil and wicks that they had. Then we started to drive south again. If you've ever driven down I-55 in Mississippi, you may be familiar with the invasive kudzu plant that covers, well, everything. All the trees, bushes, plants, etc. The closer we got to Louisiana, the more you could see the trees start to bed from wind and the kudzu disturbed. It was actually very odd. We made it as far as Washington Parish before we hit roadblocks. This was about 10 days after Hurricane Katrina, give or take. From Washington Paris to St. Tamary Parish, we wound our way in on back roads via a good old-fashioned road atlas. There was no power, no gasoline stations, nothing was open, and there was just endless storm damage. Roofs were blown off, trees were scattered everywhere, and the ones that were still standing had been blown to almost a 50 degree angle. There was localized flooding, and worst of all, lots of downed power lines. When we got to one of the family's houses, we stopped. It was on a lot of land and we could all hang out together. No one knew how long it would take to get to the lake. There was no cell service, no radio, obviously no telephone or television service. And when the sun went down, it was just dark. But there was still plenty to do. The house had suffered minor damage, but the property was a mess. I learned how to use a chainsaw. Every day was spent working from the time the sun came up until it went down. We cleared the driveway, the property, and then went to work with the rest of the community that had started to come back and worked on clearing the roads. This was in late summer, and late summer in Louisiana without AC is not a fun time. But every day was so physically demanding that we slept like logs anyway. Every other day we sent a few people to find more water, gasoline, and food. They once came to a Red Cross station near Covington, and they reported that there were at least 500 people there, and by 10am all the supplies had run out. I saw fights over very mundane things like 5 pound bags of ice, MREs, gas purchases, D batteries, and most heartbreaking, I saw people abandoning their pets because they were unable to take care of them. My dad was working abroad and as soon as he could he flew to Dallas, then Houston, then rented a car and drove across I-10 with an SUV filled with bottled water and a generator he found near Beaumont, Texas. The generator was used to cool the refrigerator and run fans at night. Three weeks after the storm, we could navigate most of St. Tamary Parish well enough, and by that point things were in full swing. Stores were getting deliveries, power lines were being repaired, roads were being consistently cleared, etc. Though the bridge from Slidell to New Orleans had been damaged and was unusable. Homes and buildings along the lake were in toothpick-sized shards. It was easily visible where the storm surge had hit and how far the water levels rose from the lake. There was a huge spike in crime, and otherwise very safe in suburban communities along the North Shore. There was consistent looting, reports of shootings, and fights in stores that were downright commonplace. It was a really horrible time. Many people lost all of their things, which sure, it's just stuff, but it isn't easy to rationalize that when three generations of heirlooms and keepsakes have been destroyed completely, along with their home, their neighborhood, and their community. I didn't know about what happened in the Superdome and Convention Center for weeks. I didn't even know that there had been a huge telethon to raise money until almost a year later. I didn't even know for almost six months if any of my friends survived. But let us not forget that the storm hit the Gulf Coast, not just New Orleans. Coastal Mississippi was devastated, and only a few weeks after that storm, Hurricane Rita gave the far west Gulf Coast its own major storm. 
I have to make sure to recognize all the road, power, telecom, etc. crews that came from all over the nation to help get people in the area connected and moving again. The other thing I want to call out is the illness that has plagued the community since the storm. I have no scientific data or even a great knowledge of things, but in my own personal inner circle, the instances of cancer since the storm would blow your mind. Mostly men and women who are older than 45 when the storm hit. And all kinds of cancer, all along the Gulf Coast, especially in adults of all ethnicities. I don't really know what gets stirred up during these storms, but I'm not exaggerating when I say more than 75% of the adults I know or knew suffered serious health complications after the storm. Here's my takeaway. FEMA obviously didn't have a plan before this storm. The Red Cross can only do as much as it possibly can. This stuff brings out the worst in people, and I love my family and friends. I was about 23, a British girl backpacking around the states alone. I had been to NYC and taken the Amtrak down the east coast and around Florida, with a ticket to fly out to Baton Rouge. I got to New Orleans and checked into the Notso Hostel, and was tired so I crashed. I woke up the next day, did some touristy stuff, and generally relaxed. I had over a week of vacation time so I was in no hurry. I was vaguely aware of the weather forecast but didn't think it was really a big deal. The next day, the hostel put up a sign saying, quote, Katrina is coming. Hurricanes mean party time in New Orleans. Get some beer, food, and water, and we'll board up the windows. I was still not worried at all. I went to the supermarket and stocked up. Someone in my dorm was trying to leave the city and found out that there was no buses or planes. The next day, there was a news report, from the mayor, I think, who said everyone had to leave the city or go to a shelter. I still wasn't worried. The shelter seemed like it wouldn't be a big deal. So I packed up my stuff with about a dozen other backpackers and went to the corner where we had been told to wait. A bus picked us up and took us to the Superdome. At first it was cool. There were loads of people, but it was pretty organized and it seemed like an interesting new experience. I stuck with the other backpackers. We were pretty much the only white people in there, which seemed strange for us, but not bad. There were guards, but they were quite chilled. Everyone was really worried about protecting the astroturf, so we were really careful where we walked. We set up camp on the bleachers and went to sleep for the night. The storm started about 6 and woke us up. It was incredibly loud and ripped off bits of the roof. It was scary, but eventually it was over. I remember seeing beams of sunlight shining through the holes in the roof. That was day 2. Then things started to get scary. I remember waking up to hear a woman screaming and yelling, my baby! Someone ripped my baby! There were a lot of unwell people. I've no idea if it actually happened or if it was a mental health symptom. People were coming down off of drugs, and I think I saw someone fall or jump off of one of those balconies. Every day more soldiers came in, with big, scarier guns. There were fights and the whole place just felt scary. There was no running water, and we were using toilets until they had shit heaped over the seats. We were trying to arrange to be transported out, so we went to meet with one of the army guys in charge. We went downstairs under the bleachers, where they had been keeping all the really old and sick people. They were sitting in wheelchairs in six inches of water, and several seemed not far away from dying. After that, I stopped complaining and got on with it. After six days, they moved us to the basketball stadium for a night, then one of the big hotels. Every day, they said that they'd be getting us out today and then we would have to stay anyway. Finally, they got us on a bus. They wouldn't tell us where we were going, but we all didn't really care at that point. I remember the bus driver being the nicest man, though. I remember when we were given the MRE meals and spent ages talking about food and what we missed. Then we were on the bus and we crossed the, quote, Welcome to Texas sign. And right there was a picnic slash barbecue place at the side of the road. We were talking about how amazing barbecue food would be, not realizing that they had set it up for us. From that day on, Texas was my favorite state. We got taken to Dallas after then, and the embassy put us up in a hotel for the night and brought me waffles and some clothes. There's more, but it's late here now and I can't really think. If anyone's interested, ask questions and I'll try to answer them. In November of 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit our forested property near the Delaware River in New York. 
We had thought that since we lived a couple of hours inland and over a thousand feet higher than sea level, we were fairly safe. We've always made some preparations in case of emergencies, but we had a lot to learn about being ready for a situation like this. We knew the storm was approaching quickly and it was going to be severe. We had waterproof canoeing go bags ready, and we had a 625 gallon above ground water storage tank and a good non electric water purification system. Even our dog had his saddlebags packed with his food and supplies, but we were not prepared for the insanity of this storm. Bugging out was not an option, at least by car. When the storm hit, the winds kept getting stronger. Just when we thought it was as bad as it could get, the wind picked up even more. Trees blew down and ripped out the power lines to our house. The circuit breaker box exploded. Several large conifers fell on top of our house, partially crushing the roof. Our daughter was watching the storm just as the wind hit and a huge tree blew down and landed directly on the roof above her room. An old garden trellis made from large timbers took the brunt of the force and probably saved her life. We gathered the kids to the center of the little house as far from windows as we could get, and we had a few battery-powered LED lanterns lit because the power was out. Trees and downed power lines blocked our streets, so we had to shelter in place and tough it out. I think that there might have been a tornado along with the hurricane too, because some trees were twisted in half and not just blown down in one direction. Once the storm passed, we had to assess the damage. No one was hurt, thankfully. We made sure the propane tank was shut off and every appliance was unplugged. Clearing the driveway and property of downed trees and debris took several days. We had no intention of clearing the roads of trees. It was too dangerous since the power lines crisscrossed everywhere. We were able to check in on our neighbors and offer what assistance we could. We had to stay in the house since the roads were impassable and dangerous. Since we had a private well and used an electric well pump, we had no running water. We had plenty of fresh water in the water tank, fortunately, and every drop of water we consumed went first through our countertop purification system. After the house was rebuilt and the storm was mostly behind us, we made a list of things that we could have done better. The first thing we did was to make a plan in case we got separated. Perhaps next time an emergency struck, we might not all be home. We planned where we could meet and who we might call for information. Over the next couple of years, we invested in a wood-burning stove and a generator that could run on either gasoline or propane. Gasoline was scarce for weeks after the storm and rationed. 20-pound propane tanks were available, though. We also built a battery bank for backup power. Several deep cycle batteries connected to a power inverter. So we had two power sources. We now all keep a pair of jeans and sturdy slip-on shoes next to our beds, so we're ready to go in five minutes flat. A few other changes were made to our preparations. We got two camp-type toilets, emergency non-perishable foods like freeze-dried backpacking meals, MREs, canned foods, more lanterns, and extra batteries of all types. We got a good quality AM, FM, and weather radio that runs on either batteries, AC power, or a crank, and we doubled the size of our garden. Some eight years later, we continued to improve our emergency preparations and refine our plans. I have been through three major hurricanes that tore up my area of Virginia pretty badly. My first lesson was learned with Hurricane Isabel in 2003. Isabel really messed our area up in the northern neck of Virginia. We had no power for 13 days. There was nowhere to get gas or ice, and I will never forget the howling of the winds and thinking that this will never stop. Many houses were lost into the Rappahannock and Potomac rivers during Isabel. My next experience was with Hurricane Irene. A microburst, or a powerful wind, came right across the street. It looked like someone's hand just cut a swath right through the trees, and I still remember the sound of that wind. It creeps me out every time. There was no power again for seven days. Last year, Hurricane Michael got us. No power for five days, and many main roads were washed out. Several roads were impassable until this past March. I do not play with these storms. Don't think just because you're not taking a direct hit that it can't be destructive. Prepare ahead of time. Buy lots of water, fill up large buckets with water to flush toilets, buy batteries, charcoal to cook food, table sandwich food like peanut butter and jelly will help too. Always have paper plates and plastic utensils. Get baby wipes for personal hygiene for everyone, not just babies. Fill your vehicles up with gas and remember your pets. 
Get extra pet food, litter, etc. Get your prescriptions and over-the-counter medicines ahead of time. And don't forget that you need an NOAA weather radio when the power goes out to stay on top of things. Be prepared to be self-sustaining for days, because you will be without power for days and possibly stranded for days too. Do not ever wait until the last minute to gather supplies, and if they tell you to evacuate, then do it. I remember the day Hurricane Ike struck Texas and Louisiana back in 2008. It was a Friday night, September 12, 2008, in Houston, Texas. I was 11 at the time and my mom and dad were sitting in front of the TV, watching as Ike crept closer towards Texas. My dad went to Walmart and got some dry food, flashlights, and batteries for the storm. I remember being really nervous because of the size of Ike. It was almost 450 miles wide, and the damage it might cause overnight. I was walking around thinking the worst and even taking a long last look at my apartment complex with my neighbor's friend. It started getting windy around 6 p.m., the winds were around 40 miles per hour, and we got scared and ran home. Twigs from the 100-foot pine trees started to break off and leaves were flying everywhere. My mom and I were walking to Pop's supermarket to get some last-minute things, and the checkout line was really long. When we were finally done, the winds blew open the door and everybody went silent. We went home as quickly as we could. Dad was in the bedroom with his hard hat on, playing with the flashlight, and he watched the news. There was a phone bank with citizens asking questions to Dr. Neal on Channel 11 about what kind of damage they could expect. I ran outside at 10 p.m. and the winds were still at 40 miles per hour, but they started to gust past 50 and I was on the porch watching the palm trees near me sway in the wind. More leaves and trash were airborne now. I couldn't stand against wind as I tried to go downstairs and the wind kept pushing me back. I gave up and went back upstairs once my folks told me it was no longer safe to be wandering around. The wind was howling at the back window. My dad managed to use an old bed to cover the window, and it was reinforced with the couch in his bedroom. I tried to fall asleep, but the wind was howling consistently, and gusts started to become a little more frequent. At around 11.30pm, it was getting really blustery outside, and my dad was trying to microwave a burrito, worst time for a snack if you ask me, and that's when the lights started to flicker. We ran to the closet, but we started to fuss when my mom didn't want to get in. She was terrified and we tried to calm her down, but another loud gust blew in and the carport downstairs started rumbling. The wind was starting to make squealing and screeching noises now. We were silent for a couple of minutes staring at the back window. I could see an outline of the trees whipping in the wind from the street light. Dad and I went inside and Mom slept in the living room. For another 30 minutes the lights would flicker as we listened to Paul and Tom on the radio. I lay down on the floor and Dad sat on his big toolbox playing with the flashlight. At around 12.30am we lost power completely and the winds got even louder. It sounded like a train one minute and a wolf howling the next second. The winds were probably between 70 and 80 miles per hour by that time. My dad went out to get my mom but I remembered my mom opening the door to look outside to get a peek. It was terrifying. In the sea of darkness the palm trees were bending back and forth violently. Water was falling from the roofs like Niagara Falls, and the giant pine trees were bending at 45 degree angles with branches just snapping off. Mom closed the door and finally took refuge in the closet. She was crying at one point and we told her that we were going to make it out. At 1.30am the back window shattered and glass and rain started to come in. I flashed a light to help Dad see, and he had to go get some trash bags to cover the TV and computer in his room, and push the couch to push the beds that were covering the broken window back up, but the winds kept pushing them down again. Around 2am, the radio said Ike made landfall at Galveston and Houston, and the surrounding area was being battered by high winds and heavy surge flooding. Dad took note of the sky looking orange when we opened the closet door to let some cool air in since it was hot inside the closet. I heard debris hitting the building and the wind was deafening. The winds were above 75 miles per hour at that time. All night the wind was screaming. We spent 10 to 12 hours in the closet until noon on Saturday. It was a mess outside. Shingles littered the floor and the tree branches and twigs were everywhere. My dad's old pair of shoes were actually still outside next to the door though. The courtyard was even worse. Pine trees were snapped in half and entire trees were down on the ground. I helped our neighbors clean up the debris and clear the pathways, and Dad went out to get more food and water. 
We ate what we could and had to walk around to find some food and hot water. Mom and Dad were really upset, but glad that we made it out unscathed. We walked around the neighborhood seeing the damage, and there was a lot of tree damage and some leaning power lines. I actually couldn't even sleep that Saturday night because of all the humidity. My mom and I were listening to updates from the major and city officials. We were both scared out of our wits, and I cried, but my mom reassured me that we made it, and we were okay. By Sunday afternoon, the power was restored, and we started to learn about the true devastation Ike did to the state. I was thankful that we didn't lose our home completely, or lives for that matter. Some areas along the coast were wrecked or wiped out from the storm surge. I remember the reporter on Channel 13 trying to get a grip on his emotions as he went through the damage and ruins at Bolivar Peninsula. Watching all the wreckage, it really ran a chill down my spine, but it showed me the true power of these cyclones. Ike would cause me to take preparations more seriously, and now I stock more supplies to prepare for every season. I know it's not much of a story, but tropical cyclones are nothing to mess with. This is the story I'll tell my kids one day. Hurricane Sandy knocked out power for seven days in my town. The town sits on the northern shore of Long Island Sound. It had been downgraded to a tropical storm by the time it affected Connecticut. The strongest wind gust recorded by my anemometer was about 47 miles per hour. One fatality was reported as a result of a falling tree on a moving car. My biggest concern was flooding in my basement. The generator that I used has a capacity of 7,500 watts. It had enough power for sump pumps, refrigeration, heat and hot water, one burner of an electric cooktop, some lights and battery chargers. It used about 10 gallons of gasoline a day, and its 3-gallon fuel tank needed to be refueled about every 8 to 10 hours. By the second day, my biggest challenge was to find an open gas station to refill portable tanks. It was unnecessary to resort to siphoning fuel from automobiles, but just barely. Fallen trees closed many local roads, and most were cleared within a day or two. Grocery stores remained closed during the power outage, but we had enough food to carry us through. A TV and DVD player were what we used for entertainment. Cell phones continued to work, but internet and cable were out for as long as the power was out. Trees fell on my property but did almost no damage to the house or autos. For my family, Sandy was a little more than a week-long nuisance. We were fortunate that our house is unlikely to be susceptible to major flooding, and none of the fallen trees landed where they could have caused damage. Coastal areas were much less fortunate, though. A section of town near the beach floods frequently. It sits just a foot or two above a mean high tide. Homeowners there know the drill. Before Sandy hit, just about every home had a U-Haul truck out front to load up everything from the first floor. Flooding reached about halfway to the second floor of many homes. Our town marina has just one narrow opening to the west. No damage was reported. Across the river, east-facing properties felt the brunt of wind-driven waves and storm surges. Several dozen boats moored in the river ended up wrecked on the shore to the west. My first hurricane was Hurricane Gloria. I was four or so and I don't really remember it. I was living in Connecticut and moved soon after. We had no power for a week and a lot of tree branches fell down. We had to shower at the gym for a week. This wasn't very traumatic. I was a kid and it wasn't too bad for me. When I was an adult, I moved to New York City for Sandy. I didn't think it would be so bad until it was. I got emergency supplies at the last minute. Flashlights and batteries. I filled my bathtub with water in case I needed to flush the toilet, and that stopped being possible. I got gallons of drinking water for me, and I got things that wouldn't spoil if worst case the power went out. I made sure that I wasn't in a flood zone either. In an act of extreme paranoia, I got a dog carrier that was a backpack in case I needed to move my dog fast. I didn't realize what good shape I was in for the hurricane. I was not living in a basement yet, and I was in a sturdy building not in a flood zone. It was mostly scary because everyone was getting really jumpy, and I had decided to stay alone with my dog because I certainly wasn't leaving her anywhere. I was single, so it was just us. I powered up my laptop in case I wanted to watch a movie to stay calm whether or not I lost power. I downloaded one and this was actually my worst choice. I picked the never-ending story. Not too many spoilers if you've never seen this fantastic film, 
but it centers around a terrifying magical storm, quote, the nothing, that is literally eating the universe until there's nothing left. Bessie, my dog, and I slept on the floor together where I moved all of my blankets. I watched the wind mile per hour gauge, and when it went down close to 25, I got her out the front door to pee. Then we were locked up again for a really long time. When it was all over, I realized how lucky I was. Places by the water were decimated. We just had debris. People lost their homes and businesses and were hurt and are still dealing with the fallout. One amazing thing is how the city cares. When I called to volunteer to help, I couldn't even get to an area that was really damaged. They said that they had too many people out there helping already. I just volunteered on the Lower East Side with people who couldn't leave their homes to get food for reasons like maybe their elevators were out because of power. There were about 20 people in my group. Every disaster is like this any place. People are afraid. Some people come out okay and others are flattened. In some really big disasters, almost no one is okay. No one spends some disasters being afraid watching a movie. It's really important to help people in situations like this who can't help themselves. It doesn't matter who they are or where it is. Disasters can happen any place and probably will more because of global warming. The disaster could happen to you, and if it does, you'll appreciate the help. I had never witnessed that level of destruction and devastation before. The eye of the storm hit around 10.30pm, so most of the guests, including myself, were sheltered in the hotel ballroom. What made this storm unique, and the reason it caught the southern Baja Peninsula so off guard, was the fact that it rapidly intensified and changed course. It was originally forecasted to head west and weaken as it went out to sea, but instead it made almost a 90 degree turn and headed directly for Cabo San Lucas as a Category 4. It was Category 3 when it actually made landfall, but the millibars of pressure in the eye were extremely low for a Category 3, and the hurricane slowed and caused massive destruction. Because of the initial forecast, people were not being encouraged to evacuate. Our hotel was prepared as possible and technically designated as a hurricane shelter with the ability of a Cat 3 storm, and we had excellent safety procedures in place. But no one expected the storm to be as bad as it was. The hotel had a shelter set up in the hotel ballroom, but also told guests that if they felt more comfortable staying in their rooms, that they were more than welcome to do so, so long as they kept the windows and doors completely shut and did not venture outside. At the point of their original instruction, the hurricane was still not expected to be such a massive threat. My friends and I originally thought that we would quote, write it out in our hotel room, and we were almost poking fun at the evacuation room that was set up. We figured that we would hole up in our room with food and wine and watch movies until the government formally shut down the power grid, as planned and mentioned in the bulletins that they were sending us. Everything was going quote, as planned for us until about 8.30 p.m., the sliding glass doors were shaking violently, and then all of a sudden a large portion of a palm tree snapped off and hit our window. It didn't shatter, fortunately, but the scare was enough for us to put all of our things in the bathroom, grab our passports and wallets, and make a beeline for the hotel ballroom. At that point in our room, there was water already starting to gurgle and getting sucked out of the toilet, and the shower was making a howling noise. Because the hotel hallways were partially outside and exposed to the elements, it also took us three hours to pull the hotel door open because of the low pressure suction. By the time we made it to the hotel ballroom, the hotel staff was already running rescue operations to retrieve people from their rooms. They were taking attendance on their hotel room roster and rescuing accordingly. There was an elderly couple being carried in with blood all over them, being cut by glass and some other injuries. None of them were really major thanks to the incredible care and rescue effort of the hotel staff. The pictures on the link below will tell the story of the destruction, but the main reason I felt that this was an important story to share was because Odial was a storm that took everyone by surprise. We were incredibly lucky to be in the care of the hotel workers who slaved away all night to keep us safe, but a lot of people were not so lucky and a widespread destruction over the Baja Peninsula was immense. So, for anyone else who doubts the power of Mother Nature and doesn't take weather warnings seriously, just take some advice from anyone who's experienced Odial. Weather forecasts can change in a heartbeat, so always err on the side of caution. We were stranded in Cabo for an extra week because the airport was completely destroyed. There was no phone service, internet, or any form of communication. Our friends and family actually feared the worst after they didn't hear for us for several days. 
and the Mexican military had to perform food drops for the local residents because all of the roads were washed out. I could write a book about all the experiences of that week, but I'll let my photos do the talking. Needless to say, I made some lifelong friends during that week, and I saw things that I couldn't imagine even in my wildest dreams. Mother Nature is beautiful and amazing, but give her respect before it's too late and she demands it from you.